Uh, my name is Sarah Vessel. Um, I have been doing design and development for a really long time. Um, we'll just leave it at that. Um, uh, for two years, I was at GitLab as a UX manager. And more recently, I have moved to CloudBees, where I'm a UX designer. Um, and this book is a book I just published with my awesome co-author, Tori Davis, who sadly is not here today. Um, and that's what I'm going to go and cover with you. We just started. No, it's totally fine. We're going to keep this very informal. So feel free to ask questions or stop me if something doesn't make sense. Um, I, like, I like to have a conversation. I don't want to just talk at you for 45 minutes. Um, so let's talk a little bit about this. And this bar, I have no idea how to get rid of it. So. <laughs> I didn't, it's not part of my design. Um, so, has really shifted from that of mere stylist to and to build products that people love, designers really do more than just solve problems. They have to work with product, engineering, sales, marketing, and the user to understand what the user needs and what the organizational goals are. So this is where design systems come in. They allow teams to structure the way they work, establishing guiding rules and principles that support and drive that creation process. And building a design system has to start with a shared understanding of what a design system actually is. So um, question, since we have a small enough audience. Uh, <laughs> it's all good. Um, What's a design system? Anybody care to throw themselves out there? Come on, take a stab. Yes, so loudly for everyone. <laughs> Go ahead, one more time. OK. I saw you in the back. What's the design system? You're just giving me crap back there. I know. That's all right. So the most common misconception, and not to call you out, because you're partly right, um, is that it's just a style guide. It's a component library, exactly what you described. Um, and so there's kind of this thought that style guides, component libraries, and design systems are all the same thing. Um, and it makes sense because style guides and component libraries are part of a design system, but it actually is, is much broader than that. And I'm going to tell you about that. Who would have thought? So <laughs> a design system houses the processes, philosophies, and all of the, the pieces that go into how you actually make your design decisions. It's not just a collection of design decisions. So it's a documented approach to systematic design. Style guides and component libraries are simply assets that help you get there. So ideally, the core of your design system is going to be tied to the code base of your application, whereas style guides and component libraries are often static and they're completely separate. They require a lot of upkeep. And with design systems, components are built, implemented, and documented with the help of front-end engineers. Now, I'm going to say design system like a gazillion times in this talk. I wish there was another word for it. There just isn't. Um, and I think a lot of people focus on the word design and think designers, and then they think typography, and they think colors, and frou-frou stuff, and then they kind of just tune out. But design systems are really about the engineering that goes into building a product and how we all work together on that product. Um, and I think it's an important distinction, distinction because uh, having everybody working on it together um, allows a deeper understanding across the organization. And design systems really let teams move faster by reducing the layer of translation between design and implementation, right? That here's a design, and then while well, I'm trying to implement this, I need to know how many pixels, I need to know what colors, I need to know what fonts. And really reducing debt is part of the, the focus of a design system. And this is just one example of the different types of things you'll see in a design system. One thing I will call out is that they're called different things under different systems. The way Atlassian does theirs is very different from the way GitLab does theirs versus MailChimp, which is kind of a disparate system across three different platforms. Um, there's a lot of differences. So you can't look at one and say, this is what a design system is. So I want to switch the focus here from, from thinking about a system to really thinking about a language. So communication, obviously, is essential in our everyday lives. 
It allows us to distribute knowledge, uh, learn complex ideas, and facilitate the development of relationships. And I think successful communication is only made possible when people speak relatively the same language, or at least have a shared understanding of the language they're speaking at the time. Um, so if you think about design systems as a shared language, your organization is going to be able to establish a better and more consistent means of communication across teams. Not just design we're talking about, we're talking about across the entire organization. So I like to start with guiding principles, and this is from material design, just an example here. Um, Principles are a method to create a language that's distinct to your organization. What your organization and your team is trying to achieve for your product is unique to you. It's not going to be the same as your competitor or as something as different as, say, Walmart compared to what you're doing, right? Everybody is unique. So you have to establish these guidelines and principles that relate to your organization and your goals. And I like to think of these principles as intention. So every design choice should be judged on whether it supports the intentions of the organization. And this can even be carried into front-end architecture and back-end architecture and the decisions you make and does that support what the goals of the product are. And in order to, to be effective, I think design principles or principles in general have to be descriptive. Um, they have to provide an anchor for teams to rally around. And when new members join, they have to be able to read these principles and immediately understand what it is you're trying to do, rally around those goals. Um, and I think that successful design principles are, are better in phrases than just uh, one or two words. And you'll see this a lot, minimal and efficient, you know, progressive and whatever. And then it's like, well, what does that mean, right? I don't really know what that means. Well, how, do I, how do I make a design that's progressive? Or how do I make a design that's minimal? So make sure that you're, you're really tuning into what that means for your organization and your product. So here, minimal and efficient becomes bring a sharp focus by helping customers know what matters now. So that helps you design a hierarchy, let's say, that lets the user focus on their particular goal and intent as they go through the flow. So we can get really technical about language in here. <laughs> so language is made up of these. You've got your lexicon and your grammar. When thinking about design as a language system, we can create a lexicon comprised of the elements in your interface. So instead of using words, we're using the pieces of your interface, right? Buttons and avatars and titles and all these little things. And then the grammar is a series of guidelines that rule how we use those in the interface. And that's how you create a design language. So lexicon, total number of fragments or words that make up a language. Essentially, for us, that's going to be our, our elements or components or however you want to reference them, organisms if you do atomic. Um, but we're talking about that base level, those individual pieces. We derive meaning from words when they're used as building blocks from sentences. Words alone may have meaning, but it doesn't convey much. Um, so within a design system, these individual aspects of your product will come together and to create components and then larger component groups and those guidelines will help you understand what they mean. So if you look at SoundCloud, and I'm not trying to call out any particular, <laughs> it was just a good example. Um, if you look at this and you think in terms of the lexicon, what are the words that they're using to communicate with us? You have things like your heart icon, your play button. The, yes, they have individual words, but you're really thinking of those as these individual pieces, right? It's a title or a long title or it's a page title. And that's the way that it's speaking to you. And this is where I, I was saying I do have a slide that looks just like that. <laughs> Got it. So we all know that language isn't just words. Um, like I said, one word may convey a part of the meaning, but it doesn't actually say what you're trying to say. So I can put these random words together in an order that makes absolutely no sense. Um, I don't know why I would want to do that except for as an example. Um, a user interface made without guidelines and rules is no better than this gibberish sentence. And so this is just to illustrate the importance of creating a set of guidelines and rules so that you're using things consistently and speaking in a consistent language to your users and to your engineers and everybody that's part of this system. So again, this is where grammar comes in. A language needs a system of rules that creates that shared understanding. So within your design system, <clears throat> your usage and technical guidelines are what makes up your grammar. 
Um, and this ensures that it's consistent from page to page. And more importantly, if it's an established grammar, it's an established guideline, then no one has to wait for design to jump in and make a decision, right? If you have the power to go in and say, well, I need to, to put together something that does X, Y, Z, let me look in the design system and see what our guidelines are for that, you don't have to wait for me to have time to help you. You can put something together and then say, hey, I put this together based on our guidelines, what do you think? Um, and that's the whole point, is to get everybody involved. Everybody here is part of this design. So I wanna look back at this SoundCloud example again. Um, particularly, we have three uh, play components here, and it's really hard to see this thing. But you've got one here in the bottom of the screen, the orange at the top, and then you've got these little green um, What do you think happens if you press any one of those? The song starts, right? You would expect that. That's not true. <laughs> so the that just tells you how many plays there are. And so that is something that could potentially be confusing. So you'd want to look at, maybe there's a reason. There, there could, it could be documented in their guidelines why they do it. Um, there could be, that makes sense. They do have a red color, which kind of a little bit, right? So maybe it, it, it's two separate sets of guidelines coming together. But that's an example that I could find where mm, it might be a little bit confusing. It might be a little bit unexpected. Um, and this is the way that you can use guidelines to help make user experience more predictable and more understandable. So how do you find your lexicon? How many people here work with a design system? How many people would like to work with a design system? Thank you, that's so nice. Okay, good, I'm glad. <laughs> so finding your lexicon, it really depends on the state of your organization, how are you gonna go ahead and get started? Um, there are two different ways. So if you're starting with legacy or with an existing product, you're gonna break down the interface into, into single elements to try to make it, have an understanding of the different categories and how to, how to uh, categorize everything together. If you're just starting, then you're gonna build up, right? You're gonna start with those small elements, just like in atomic design, um, if that's the methodology you subscribe to, and you're gonna build up into bigger components and regions. So this is just kind of a, a, an illustration of starting small, um, you can start by identifying what elements are commonly used, and for everybody that's gonna be things like buttons and forms and specific types of text. Um, once you have those, you can start to build on them and make more complex component groups and, and start to build up those separate regions. Component groups can then be combined into even larger areas. So if you look at this, this is like a basic navigation bar. You've got multiple tabs, a search bar, drop downs. When large groups of components come together, they, they have their own distinct set of rules. So the rules that govern a button are different than the rules that govern a button, a button within a navigation. So that's building this whole set up. Does that make sense? Okay, good. Sometimes I say it I'm like, I don't know if that makes any sense. <laughs> it makes sense to me. <laughs> um, so if you've already designed interfaces, you can, again, you can begin by breaking things down. So you take something like this and you just work backwards. You'd start separating those out and seeing how they could possibly be different in different regions and different areas. I'd say that the most effective way, if you're starting from something like this, which is usually what I start with, I don't know that I've ever started from scratch, um, is to do an inventory. It can be really eye-opening if you do an inventory um, to see how many different variants of the same button you have or how many different sizes of the same icon you have, or how many different kinds of gray you have. I think that's probably the biggest designer no-no that I've seen is like 8,000 shades of gray. Wait, not that one. All right, moving on. <laughs> so documentation is key, and I think it's probably one of the hardest things to keep up, right? I think we all have good intentions when we start out, and we're like, yeah, we're gonna write it all down and keep it all together, and then, you know, deadlines and sprints and other things and other priorities, and before you know it, that falls apart. Um, but I, I have to say, it's really important. It's important to, to write that time in for yourself and make it happen. And there's different ways to do it. I'm more than happy to talk about that after my talk. If anyone's interested, I've, I've helped to implement this kind of system before. So there are ways that you can actually make time for this. But the important thing to, to remember is that by writing down your guidelines, you're reinforcing desired behaviors and promoting that consistency 
Ultimately, this encourages all teams to use your system and not have to wait for UX to jump in and, and assist. And I'm not going to read all of these to you. We lost a little bit of time, so I think I'll skip past this one. Um, and I'll make this slide deck available. It has all of my notes after. But these are just some of the things that, that I think are really important to make sure that you are um, documenting within your system. I don't know what's loading. That's really interesting. This is the craziest talk I've ever given. OK, so <laughs> we'll see what happens. We'll see what comes up. Um, so question, uh, have you ever been asked to explain something that you know really well, and you just don't know how to explain it? And then you feel really dumb, right? You're like, I know how this works. Like, I know what this means. <sighs> I would say, how many designers in the room? I think as designers, we do a really shit job at this. I'm just going to, I'm calling us out. Um, we, we do a really bad job at explaining why one, one design is a better user experience than another, right? Um, we have to get better about doing that and, and kind of step outside of our comfort zone of talking in terms of hierarchy and typography and vertical rhythm and things like that that really make sense to us and break it down into its simplest term, okay? So more often than not, we're not going to be the decision makers in the organization. Spoiler alert. Um, <laughs> To see our ideas come to pass, this is a terrible screen. We're going to go back here. Well, well, I can't. All right. Anyway, enjoy the loading. Um, to see our ideas come to pass, we have to advocate, right? We have to go to the decision makers and explain why the one experience is better, why one technical guideline makes more sense than another. Um, we can't just be value convinced of the value of our ideas. We have to show that value to others. Okay, I feel good. This one went. So as I said, every, every organization is unique in its offerings and its challenges. And that's both the challenges to the product and the space that you're working in and the challenges of the, the individual teams you know, and, and the people that you're working with. Um, so communicating the value and benefit um, in a relatable way is critical. So I like to approach it as I would any design problem. Uh, I start by defining um, what the problem is. Right? What, what's the goals of the, of the design system? What problems are we solving with this design system? What are the goals of the organization? How can we align UX design goals with broader organizational goals or with individual team goals? Right? If you're trying to get buy-in from front end, what are they trying to achieve that your design system is going to help them get to? So to begin answering these questions, I think it's really important to think of this in, in three dimensions of value. I think you can break it down into three target audiences, right? You've got the employees of the organization, which is you. Uh, you have the users of the product that you're building. And then you have the organization yourself. So they are all <coughs> users, ben benef benefitees, is that even a word? Mm -hmm. Benefactors? Thank you. Benefactors of your design system. So for the book uh, that we put together, we actually did a survey. Um, are you laughing? I heard that. Heckling. I just want, it's recorded. I've been heckled. So <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> so for the book, what we did was we actually did a survey um, of all different people within organizations. We put it out on Twitter. We actually put it through at GitLab because that's where we were uh, working at the time. And we wanted to know what frustrated the most in their work. Like, what are their goals personally, professionally? What are they trying to achieve? What is, is the, the hardest thing for them to get done? And then use that to build up uh, personas for the different employees within an organization. So we're going to start by looking at that, the value to the, to the employees, basically us. So for designers, the majority of designers we spoke with placed problem solving and elevating their perception of design at the top of their priorities list. We often feel undervalued as designers. Um, we feel like our work isn't appreciated as much, much as it should be. Um, we feel frustrated by vague requirements and a lack of information about what it is we're building and who we're building it for. Now, design systems can actually help alleviate that um, by enabling designers to move faster and be more productive and have more time to delve into that discovery process and understand users better. An established system is going to give you access to styles, components, and implementation guidelines from the get-go. You're not reinventing the wheel every time a new problem comes up. You have solutions already. 
it buys you time to dig deeper and understand motivations and goals beyond just what the, the outer aesthetic is going to be. And I think they also give designers an opportunity to set out, step outside of their traditional tool set. Um, and this is not a designer should code statement here, but if they have the ability to work with prototypes, whether that's in code or in vision or as part of the design system, I think it allows them to, to dig even deeper and really get closer to the product in a way that engineers usually are that we aren't. Um, and that's just another benefit of having a design system. You're kind of seeing it seeing the, the product outside of the ideal world of, of sketch, right? So then shockingly, because there's such a divide often between designing and designers and engineers, the engineers we spoke with felt the same way. Too many meetings, inadequate requirements, uh, missing design assets, and a lack of discovery. They were upset as well. They wanted to understand better what they were building and who they were building it for. Um, so, Again, the benefits a design system can bring to engineers is clear, right? They can clarify solutions, make assets readily available, and give them the tools to work autonomously and not feel blocked by design or by PM. And I think one of the biggest parts is that design to developer handoff. There's a lot of time that can be spent in redlining and, and explaining where things should go and how they should go. If you have an established set of, of uh, padding and margin and vertical rhythm for your typography, um, or if it's already built into the CSS that you're using, you don't even have to worry about that. It's already part of what you're doing. So there's, there's a lot of benefits to be had for engineers when it comes to a design system. So looking at products, uh, product managers, um, I think product managers tend to outnumber UX designers as an organization. That's been my personal experience. Um, and this situation can sometimes cause tension and I think trust issues between product and UX because product wants to get moving with something. They're talking with engineers, the sprint has started, but there's just not enough UX designers to sit and actually map something out for them. So they feel blocked. So again, same thing. Documented usability patterns and guidelines are gonna enable them to go ahead and put something together that fits in with what UX would put together and then get approval for it or at least run it by a designer instead of just kind of jamming it in and saying, sorry, we couldn't wait for you. And then we had a lot of responses from sales and marketing. And I think GitLab was the first place where I ever had a lot of interaction with sales and marketing. Um, and it was really interesting. I learned so much about the product through talking to salespeople that were day to day talking to our users, right? The bar for application design is, is really high at this point. Um, potential users want to know that what they're buying has the features they need and that they're not going to get frustrated using it. So the sales department will often reach out to product and engineering teams to get answers on questions, right? They want to know, is this something that we're working on? Is this uh, something in the future? This is something this customer needs in order to close this deal. And we actually found that sales and marketing were really close. Just like design and engineering were really close in their frustrations and goals, sales and marketing were very close in their frustration and goals. Um, they wanted to learn more about the product itself. Um, and believe it or not, a design system is a great onboarding tool for those coming in in sales and marketing because it's often going to get to contain a lexicon like what is it that we call the different things that we have within this system you know do we call them teams do we call, call them groups it's going to define all of that it's going to help them understand better the language when they look at the product they have a much better idea of what it is that this piece is supposed to do and how that helps the user and they also pointed to a lack of urgency from product design and engineering as, as a blocker right for them they have a certain amount of time to close this deal, make their numbers, and get things going. Um, and often they're waiting for answers. So again, a design system can hopefully quickly answer some of these things, particularly if you include a roadmap in your design system, which I encourage a lot of companies to do. Um, it shows that you're you are committed to good design and creating value to your users. So when we look at the organization, so we looked at employees, let's look at an organization and how a design system can actually help them. Um, I will say that as designers, it's, it's really frustrating to have a seat at the table, but feel like you have no power, right? They're like, oh, but you're here. Yes, but no one's listening to me. <laughs> or they're pretending to listen to me and then there's no action being done. So 
you know, push that pressure to, to push out results um, can make you feel more like a consultant than a partner, even when you, you are given that seat at the table and you're a checkbox in a process rather than a driver in that process, right? So I think that, again, we need to get, be better at communicating how design is, is getting ROI. Like, what is the ROI of the design that we're, we're putting together? What is the, the return on investment for this design system? Um, you can't just say that it's going to incre increase consistency um, and that users will love it. Like, yeah, that sounds great, but that's not quantitative data. That doesn't show me anything. Um, so you need to speak their language and describe benefits in terms of ROI. So what does the organization stand to gain from the time and money being spent on a design system? Because often you're going to have to bring in a dedicated team. At a certain point, it's going to be too much for, for everyone to do the work that they need to do and then work on that design system. And then how is that design system going to increase revenue, customer retention, productivity? You can actually track these things. Um, finding ways to tie this value into revenue and profit is going to make a much more compelling case for your design system. I would say that if a particular, particular feature or feature set is an anchor for sales and marketing, right? it's a roadmap for the year, it's something that, that the company is talking about at conferences and they're really focused on, then um, mapping your design system goals to that feature set, how you're going to, to put together that feature set and, and roll it out can help you um, get buy-in from the organization for that. And then, of course, let's not forget the user. They're supposed to be the most important person, right? <laughs> so the primary benefit, of course, is uh, for the end user. Um, delighting users uh, is often determined, is what will determine the success of a product, right? It, is it usable? Is it something that I enjoy using, particularly enterprise? If this is something my company is mandating I use every single day, I want it to be enjoyable. I don't want to have to complain about it every single moment of my life. I want to feel like I can get done what I need to get done within this product. So, uh, what time are we at? We're getting there. I think I have 15 minutes. I can do this. <laughs> Lost a little bit of time. Um, so the way you tackle um, your design system is largely going to depend on your organization. So I would always begin by assessing the type of organization, your stakeholder buy-in. So like, how much buy-in are you actually getting? Is this something you're going to have to kind of ramp up grassroots? You, the design team and a few front-end engineers, and then rope people in as you can show how this is actually benefiting. Um, so looking at that, what type of organization are you in? Are you building a product? Are you building multiple products? Or are you an agency? So are you supporting clients? Um, when working on one application, you can start by defining layout and styles. It's much easier, right? You have one application, you have one goal, you're all working towards the same thing. It's kind of the ideal environment. Um, and those guidelines will establish a foundation. Agencies is a bit different. You often have multiple clients. Um, and you can build a vanilla design system and use theming and design tokens to alter that for different clients. And really reduce your ramp up time right, with these different clients. And I've actually talked with uh, agencies that part of what they do is they actually build design systems for their clients. Um, that's part of what they actually do. Um, so it's not going to be much different from one to the other. I think it's just a little bit more complicated if you're talking about different products. At a certain point, you have to decide are they going to come together and align, or are there differences between each that make sense based on the individual goals of product A versus product B. Um, but if you start with a layout that's driven by a central set of variables, um, that flexible layout is going to give you a solid foundation that will allow you to customize product to product while still starting with a, that nice infrastructure. And then organizational support. So the support you have from others is going to play a critical role in how you build out your system. So if you don't have buy-in from, from stakeholders, you're going to have to be a little bit more strategic. Um, in, in how you approach implementation. Um, it's really helpful, but it's not necessary. I talk to a lot of people that are like, listen, I can't, um, I can't, I've, I've, I've brought it up many times and they just say, no, we don't have time, we don't have time. Everyone has time to organize the work that they're doing and share that organization with others. And that's how you can start a grassroots com 
campaign for this kind of thing, whether it's sharing an asset library within Sketch or convincing a team to go to Figma or use Abstract. There are different ways that you can start to align with others and then start putting in that design system. I think as you start working together and you, if you keep track of those improvements, you know, you keep data on how long was it taking you to do something before you started uh, aligning things a certain way. Maybe it took you two or three hours to do something that now takes you a half an hour. That's, that is something that you can quantitatively show to the organization as a benefit of getting organized within a, a design system. And then it really matters how big your team is. As I said, the small teams typically struggle. They're overloaded, they're doing too many things, and especially in design, they're often also getting pinged left and right for PowerPoint presentations and things like that. Unfortunately, <laughs> I see some smiles. I think, think you know what I'm talking about. Um, so it can be really difficult to see that you have the time to build out a fully functioning system. Um, and I think the, the, the problems you're gonna face will depend on whether you have a large team or a small team. I will say I'm in a large team now and part of the problem is actually finding the time to come together and align. It, we're all so deep in what we're doing individually that um, it can be difficult sometimes to find that, that space where you come together and have conversations about that. Um, so just be aware of the challenges um, that your organization is, is facing and come up with a game plan. Um, talk about it, be aware of it before you just try to start doing something. So once you've established your goals, it's time to start building. I mean, and I think this is the hardest part. There's kind of this analysis paralysis that happens. It's really easy to talk about things in theory and what you'd like to do and how you'd like it to go. And then there's this hesitation to start. Um, and I really encourage you just to start. That's what we did at GitLab. We started with, we a absolutely published something that had a bunch of to-dos in it. It was embarrassing. Um, it, it really was, it's like, you know, are we really gonna do this? And we're like, yes, we are. And so having that to-do list, now we had an organization, we had the, the theory and, and the kind of definition and the way that we wanted to go, and now we had this list of to-dos. And we, so we just started picking up these to-dos and implementing that system. And it was really the catalyst to get us going. And it requires a lot of different activities. Best practices, like, you know, what is your research gonna look like? Um, getting that interface uh, inventory, if you already have something set up, getting those guidelines, documenting, reviewing, as much as you can automate it. That was a big thing for us, was resisting the temptation to take screenshots of sketch files and just stick it in this system. Because all you've done is created a documentation nightmare for yourself. So always approach it with a self-documentation in mind. It's better to have words than pictures you have to upkeep. At least at least start there and then hopefully you can work to get components in that are going to be that single source of truth and will update based on changes that are made in the system. And actually, I think to me the most important thing is, is the thing at the bottom. Celebrate the small wins and evangelize as much as you poss possibly can. Um, it's really tempting to kind of hold on to it until it's better, until it's something that you're proud of, until it's something that you feel like people are going to get excited about. Don't do that because what's gonna happen is nobody knows you're working on it. You're gonna put all kinds of things together. I guarantee you other people are probably working on things as well because they have no idea what you're working on. Um, and you're gonna lose a lot of valuable time in, in getting that buy-in and getting people excited. So you, you put a button in and you define buttons, announce it in the Slack channel. Got buttons! Like it sounds stupid, but do it. it I'm serious. And then everyone's like, yeah, you got buttons. Like all of a sudden, everybody's really excited about it. I know it sounds silly, but it works. I promise you, it works. And of course, there's kind of this idea of like, you know, yeah, we're gonna build it and then it'll be done. No, no, I'm so sorry. It will never be done. Um, you really have to analyze what you've put in. Uh, you know, again, try as much as you can to use those quantitative and qualitative methods, right? You're tracking your progress. How much time is it taking you? How much time are you saving? Um, is there a better handoff? Is there better communication? All of those things. And then go back to ideation to build, analyze, and I mean, it's just gonna go on and on and on. It sounds terrible, but it is really fun once you get going. This was an awesome slide. Sorry, I can't see it. Um, design systems are not foolproof. Uh, they can fail for many, many reasons. Um, and I think as a teacher, I'm some, I've, I've done a lot of teaching, and I find there's more value 
in showing people the mistakes that can happen and what can go wrong than giving them the happy path and then patting them on the back and being like, <laughs> good luck, dude. Like, you got to know what could go wrong. I think first and foremost, and I've said it a million times, I'm going to say it again, is a lack of buy-in or at least a lack of evangelizing and letting people know what you're working on. Maybe you don't have buy-in yet, but you have to have awareness. Um, before making any decisions or taking any steps, talk to other people as much as you can. Get their ideas, get their opinions. Um, let them voice their concerns and feel that they've been heard and that they're part of this process. And I always approach these conversations from the perspective of problem solving. Instead of telling people how they'll benefit from, from my design system, I ask them, what are their pain points? What are the problems that I could solve for them? What are the things that I could do in my role as a UX designer that would make their life easier and make it better to work with me? Because that's, that's a much better place to come from than the other place I've seen people come from <laughs> with design systems. <laughs> um, you don't want to mandate something. You want to start a conversation. I see a lot of people try to do too much too soon. There's this excitement that happens, and you'll get one or two people that spend hours and hours and hours past their normal workday, nights and weekends, putting together this amazing set of guidelines that they're just going to drop like a bomb on the team. And, and yeah, and and everyone knows what. It, someone just is like, is like, I I built this, and this is what we're going to use. Boom, here it is. Do you feel like? Well, why didn't you ask me? Like, I don't, have a, I don't have anything to say in this process. Why didn't, you know, I have thoughts. Maybe I disagree with the way you did it. And so I think, and I see it a lot, and it comes from a good place, but the results are not good. And it's one of the biggest mistakes that I see. I see a lot of people having one-on-one -on -one conversations and not surfacing those into a group, not putting those into group channels or into public issues. So make sure that you're having, you're, you're not trying to do too much. Um, because the flip side, too, is you're going to do a lot and you're going to burn out. And so you're going to have all of this progress. You're going to do it a ton. And then you're going to do nothing. And stakeholders are going to be like, what happened? What happened, you, what happened to this amazing thing that you're going to build? I see, I see a bunch of to-dos. I see nothing, right? You have to have progress. Consistent progress is better than a lot and then nothing. I've done this perfection I think we suffer from this more than every little detail. Iteration is going to be key. Um, and I think that's the biggest thing I learned at GitLab, and I will always, always take that with me everywhere I go. You should be embarrassed by the first thing that you put out there. It should be embarrassing. You should be like, oh, man, I'm sorry. Sorry I'm doing this to you. But, but it starts a conversation. And then someone's like, hey, this, this, and this. And then someone else is, what about this? And then you start iterating. And you're starting from that place. Instead of that where you show everyone. So I think get comfortable with the idea that it's never going to be perfect, and it certainly will never be done. Um, maintenance. So again, and, and this is just another back to that point of don't start creating something that's going to be a monolith. It's something that you have to spend an enormous amount of time upkeeping. Um, as much as you can a self-documenting system. And that can even be the guidelines documented within components that gets exported to Markdown, and then it's right there in the system. So you actually have engineers that are, are documenting the usage for these components, rather than you having to go in and type things up. And then design system envy. We all have it. Um, it's really great to use other design systems as inspiration, but don't, don't compare yourself to them. A lot of the ones that we see have huge teams dedicated most of us don't. So use them as a you to move forward because it's not as good as this other system. Oh my god. Craft is trying to remind me to update. No craft. Um, but do you even need a design system? I probably should have asked that at the beginning, right? Uh, maybe I should start with that next time. So I think there are a few factors. Um, it's really exciting and it's really tempting to jump on the bandwagon and say, yes, we need a system. This is going to make everything better. But I think that it depends on the age of your organization. If you're just starting out, you, you, you're a startup and you're really doing a proof of concept way too early. You don't need it. You have one, one designer and a couple of engineers or a couple of designers and a few engineers. It Lay down some basic guidelines so that 
all on the same page, but don't try to build a big system. I think that is going to um, cause a lot of overhead too soon, and then no one will ever want to do a design system. And then team size, same point. If you're just one or two, you may not need something. You may need to start by establishing guidelines on how you collaborate and work together and how you translate that to product and marketing um, or engineering. But basically, um, as you get bigger, you're probably going to need a, a little bit more structure, and that's where a design system could come into play. Um, making sure that whatever system you're using is scalable as you grow is really important. <coughs> and then the type of work. Um, there are definitely, I, I, I've seen agencies where a design system would not, be, would not be helpful. The type of work that they're doing is very varied, um, and there's not really a lot of value to them putting together a, de a design system. Um, and I've seen, I've actually seen others where they have multiple products and each product kind of has a, a baby design that goes with it. Um, but there's no need to kind of... I'm almost done. So, <laughs> so our own design system is really exciting, um, but it's also daunting. Um, I, my hope is that some of these methods and ideas will help you with a different perspective and understand challenges and how to uh, go about making changes in your own organization. I do want to say please feel free to quit and ask well, unless it's for just want to put that out there. Struggling, I'd love to let you learn mistakes. So thank you. <laughs>